So today's lecture, we talked about radioactive dating and how it pertains to how old things are. Um, some things to review or think or to think about uh, was that this this graph over here on the right hand side is the relationship between number of radium atoms and the number of years it takes for them to go through a decay. So the original sample has uh, the original sample has 120 atoms in it, and the uh, sample after one half life would have roughly 60 atoms in it. So as a result of that, if I went and took 60 and dropped down, I could determine the number of years in one half life. So in this case, the number of years in one half life for radium is two years. And so then if I added two more years, I could determine that the sample after a second half life would be 30 atoms. <clears throat> So radioactive dating, as we are going to talk about in class here, says that half-lives of certain elements help scientists to determine how old an object is. This is based on how much of the radioactive element is left in the sample after a half-life or after a, a period of decay. So what this picture down here is showing is that granite rock that is at 100% uranium uh, will decay and change into, or will go through one half-life, and turn into a rock that has some lead and some uranium in it. Um, <clears throat> something just to know about uranium, when it decays, it will go through multiple steps to decay to get a nuclei that goes from being incredibly unstable to significantly more stable, and lead is the end of that chain of decay. Um, some other thing, some other definitions to be to be aware of is that the original sample is often referred to as the parent sample, and the sample after a half life uh, is referred to as the daughter sample. That is the thing that I'm not really sure as to why it is. It's just the way that it is. Now, the original attempts to gauge how old the Earth were, um, or how old the Earth is. Uh, was really, really kind of not accurate. The first way that we did it is we had we took family trees or lineages and we added up the the people and how old they lived and the, in order to effort in an effort to determine how old the Earth was. This was most likely done by looking at bloodlines of royalty, and hopefully you would realize that that's not a very accurate way to do things. So subsequent or later attempts were done by geologists looking at layers of rock and adding up the time it took for those layers to form. So if they said that the, the first layer took, you know, I don't know, something like 50,000 years to form and a second layer took like uh, another 100,000 years to form, you add those up, you would say, well, those two layers would be 150,000 years. So in theory, that's how old that section is of the Earth. Um, that also wasn't very accurate. So the most recent attempt was done by radioactive dating of galena, which happens to be a mineral. Um, and the way that they did that is they, they basically took how long it took to, for the, the uranium in Kalina to decay uh, to half, and they were able to do some math and figure it out from there. So they estimated that the age of the Earth, Earth is roughly 4.5 billion years old. Now, this slide is a link that doesn't work, but it's a link to two videos that I showed in class about radioactive dating. I posted both of those videos on Google Classroom, and I suggest you pause the video here, go watch those videos, and then come back, and uh, we'll, dis we'll continue the lecture. Okay, welcome back. We know that the half-lives of many elements um, and, how to, and use them to determine how old things are based on how long the half-life is. So, for example, beryllium with a mass number of 10 will decay to boron with a mass number of 10. And after 1.5 million years, in a sample of 100 atoms of beryllium-10 will decay to 50 atoms of uh, boron-10. And so that's what this chart is showing us. It, hopefully you see that carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 is the quickest half-life, and that's one of the ones that we use a lot in uh, gauging how old things are. 
but there becomes a certain point in time where it's not where it doesn't work for us anymore. And so the last statement here says each method above can be used accurately for dates up to about 10 times the half-life ago. So carbon-14 uh, with a half-life of 57,000 years, uh, 10 times that half-life, uh, it gets to be about 50-ish thousand years. And as a result of that, what ends up happening is, is that it's 50-ish thousand years past 5,700 years. And as a result of that, we, it's only good for that period of time. So we would use something like chlorine, which would decay to argon after 300,000 years for an object older than that. So why does carbon-14 work? So all the living things uh, take in carbon-14 when they're alive. They take it in through food. They take it in through uh, the plants and animals that they eat. After that organism dies, it stops taking in carbon-14. And so at that particular point in time, the organism starts to uh, decompose and the carbon in that organism starts to decay. And so the carbon-14 will decay to nitrogen-14. Now, we, just, we should remember that when an, when an element decays into another element, but the mass number stays the same, that's an example of beta decay. Beta decay, uh, to refresh your memory, is when an element will emit a high-energy electron, and that high-energy electron comes from the fact that a singular neutron will split and form a proton and one electron. And so what happens is that those uh, protons and electrons or the, the proton keeps the mass number the same and the electron gets emitted and then this will continue until we get to a uh, s much more stable nuclei. So by comparing the amount of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 in a sample, we can determine when that particular object died. Now, looking at this table or this graph up here, at the one mark, we are at 100% of the value of um, carbon-14 in an object and here we are at 0% of um, nitrogen-14. So after one half-life, the amount of nitrogen-14 and the amount of carbon-14 are equal to each other. And at the second half-life, the amount of carbon-14 has decreased by the rate that the amount of nitrogen-14 has increased. And that pattern continues all the way down until there is no more carbon-14 and you're left with, with all of the nitrogen-14. This is a, these are two different graphs that allow us that allow me to show you the same thing we just talked about, but just in a different picture. I'd like to focus specifically on this one over here because I have a pictogram where I have at 100% of the parent atoms remaining, I have 20 parent atoms and zero uh, daughter atoms. After one half-life, I have 10 parent atoms and 10 daughter atoms. And after second half-life, I have five parent atoms and 15 daughter atoms. And after the fourth or the third half-life, I have two and a half parent atoms and 17.5 parent atoms. Basically, it's the same thing as the graph on the last slide. It's just a different way to represent it. The last thing that we need to discuss today is the other, there are other methods for carbon date, for dating, and one of the reasons why we, I bring this up is because carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life and can only be used accurately for dating up to about 50,000 years. Other isotopes with longer half-lives can be used to date older samples. So, for example, uranium will decay into lead over time. Uranium is an unstable nuclei. Lead is a significantly more stable nuclei. It does it through about four or maybe five steps in terms of decay, and it takes about one billion years to go from uranium to lead for a half-life. And so then after a second billion years, we have more lead than uranium, and after a third billion years, we have even more, more lead than uranium. Now, uh, so that's the end of the notes for the day, and um, your homework is to complete radioactive dating worksheet number four. Uh, there is an error on that worksheet. I'm going to post a picture of what the worksheet should look like um, or the diagram that's missing on there on Google Classroom for you to take a look at and hopefully be able to finish the homework. And we will see you tomorrow.